pitch to you all, and I got such support. <laughs> Mel relented and said, okay, you can do panel two, but I'm watching you. <laughs> so he's going to sit right over there. I resign. Tell him about the tags. The, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. So in true bubblehead fashion, when we leave, when you leave today, please leave your name tag, but we'll collect those and do it again. Just the holders. Just the holders. Okay, not your name, just the holders. Okay. So, this is the second panel and final panel for the day. And uh, I'd like to do some introductions, starting over on the far left. And Christine Benz. Uh, she's Morningstar Director of Personal Finance and a senior columnist for Morningstar.com. Please welcome Christine Benz. Next to her, we have Alan Roth, who's the founder of Wealth Logic. He's an author, an author and an art columnist, AARP columnist. Please welcome Alan Roth. Next to Alan, we have Mike Piper. He's a Missouri licensed CPA and the author of the blog, Oblivious Investor. He's also authored a number of very successful digital books. Please welcome Mike Piper. And last but not least, uh, founder of the low-cost investment firm, Portfolio Solutions, author of six investment-related books, Forbes.com columnist and a Wall Street Journal expert contributor, please welcome Rick Perry. So there was a question about asset allocation that was, prepared, was for the first panel, and uh, there are some people on this panel that would probably like to start with a response to that question as well. So I'll open up the question for the panel uh, on the question that came up about asset allocation. Which one? Which one? Oh, which one was it? You guys tell me. Rebalancing, sorry. Rebalancing, yes. Uh, well, the, the question was, how often should you rebalance? Well, first, should you rebalance? How often should you rebalance? Quarterly, annually, bands, and so forth. And, uh, and then the panel was asked to comment. So we'll start with the left side and work our way over. <laughs> I think uh, less is more when it comes to rebalancing, but I like the idea. Vanguard has done some nice research on this topic, too, where you just do that annual check-in, I think once or twice a year is plenty. See how much your portfolio has diverged from your targets. Five percentage points seems reasonable. Vanguard's research generally supports the um, rebalancing at five percentage point divergences. I think if you want to be hands-off or if transaction or tax costs are a big consideration or if a lot of your portfolio is taxable, that maybe lean toward even higher rebalancing thresholds, maybe 10 percentage points. I am also a big fan of paying attention to the sub-rebalancing that you can do. So um, at various points in time, even though um, maybe your equity allocation is five percentage points above your target, You've got specific holdings that have really been the drivers of that strong performance. So starting your rebalancing there. I also um, tend to find rebalancing really uh, effective when I sync it up. I help my mom with her RMDs. And so syncing up the rebalancing process with that RMD process, we're always trimming whatever has performed best for her, that's where we go for her RMD. So just a couple of thoughts on that front, but I guess I generally agree that less is more. Uh, I used to think that picking an asset allocation was the most important decision, and I've changed my mind. It's committing to stick to an asset allocation. That, that is even more important. If you look at the Morningstar data um, over the last 10 years, you'll just see that the average investor return was 2.49% below the average fund return. So picking a band, and generally I think five percentage points is, is really good, and sticking to it, actually over the long run, uh, it, it's a risk management strategy, but it's also a market timing strategy that that happens to work. 
you're, you're hoping in the long run, you know, selling what's performed the best and, and buying what's performed you know, the worst. Contrarian might we call it. Rebalancing is definitely a topic about which I do not have strong feelings. If you want to rebalance every day because you're using a target retirement fund, great. If you want to rebalance once a year because that's easy, it's easy to remember to do it on your birthday or half birthday or whatever, great. Just like Alan said, just stick to a plan, whatever plan it is that you come up with. Hey, I have some thoughts. <laughs> By the way, I'm sitting in Jack Fogel's seat. So. <laughs> Still feeling. <laughs> um, this did a lot of work on rebalancing, crunched a bunch of numbers. It's overrated. Um, I think that it's oversold. And I'm not saying this because I'm sitting in Jack's seat, but I think he said the same thing. I think that as an advisor, and I am an advisor, that it's used for a lot of marketing by the advisors. I think it actually leads to higher taxes because you're doing this rebalancing when you really don't need it. So, uh, you know, my, my thinking on rebalancing as I continue to crunch these numbers is shifting towards Christine's less is more idea. I think that you can do this mostly with cash flow, either a distribution from a required minimum distribution, or if you're adding money on a regular basis, you could use the cash to rebalance. Dividends and interest as it comes into your portfolio, if you take it in cash, you can rebalance using that way. And I think that's almost enough. Uh, if there is a big shift in the market, 20% down, 20% up, and your asset allocation is off by a significant amount, and you want to do a rebalancing, that's fine. In the taxable account, of course, you want to take long-term capital gains. Or if the market's down, make sure you're not taking any gains, but uh, do it in conjunction with tax loss harvesting. But um, I will also say that in my uh, research that if you have a portfolio that's high in equity, 70, 80%, if you do rebalancing maybe once every 10 years, that's probably enough. So, um, that's, those are my uh, new, new and improved thoughts on rebalancing. I think that the cash flow side of it is the most important side. Uh, and, and having a plan, as Alan said, is important as well. But I, I just think that uh, the whole rebalancing thing has been overhyped by the advisory community because that's how we get paid after we create a portfolio for you. I didn't, I didn't really say that. <laughs> I think it's true. Rick, I have a follow-up question for you. Um, if I'm not rebalancing or doing it very infrequently and, and sort of normal equity bond cash relationships hold, my equity piece is going to be going up and up and up and that runs contrary to what most people think about when they're thinking about sort of a glide path. So uh, how, do you, how do you get those things together? Okay, uh, Wade isn't here, but uh, <laughs> Wade's new philosophy on an asset allocation in retirement if you start out with a relatively low equity exposure, somewhere between 20 and 40 percent, and I'm actually just writing, finishing up a paper that says around 30 percent, so I ended up being right in the middle after talking with Wade while I was here. And then, for the rest of your life, you don't rebalance at all. Uh, you take the cash flow from the stocks, you take the cash flow from the bonds, and you let the equity exposure increase because that's a better match to your future liabilities down the road. So it's an interesting concept. Uh, Wade and uh, Michael Kitsis have, uh, have developed this idea. So, um, back uh, your question. I'm talking about the accumulation years, really, at some point. Even, so say I want to get my equity piece down to 20% 20, 20 of my portfolio. That has to happen at some point. Right. And if I'm not rebalancing during the accumulation years, how's that working? Well, again, during the accumulation years, you could, I wrote an article one time called The Flight Path Approach to Asset Allocation, where it basically says younger people don't have a lot of experience in the market. Uh, we had a conversation with Mike uh, yesterday or the day before, or yesterday actually, talking about the fact that the younger people, a lot of the millennials, are scared to invest in stocks. So should you just go running in with a 90% allocation and say, oh, you're young, you should have 100% stocks and 90% stocks. I don't think that's the right idea for, for young people. I think that the starting them out low in stocks 
and then letting them gradually build as they go through a few bear markets might be actually a better idea. So then it gets to the question of rebalancing. If you want to build that equity side over time as they get used to bear markets, maybe you don't need to rebalance. So all I'm saying is uh, this whole idea of rebalancing, I believe, needs to be uh, rethought. Um, it, it, it's nice. It sounds good. And I'll also tell you that uh, the volatility of a 60-40 portfolio is much higher than the volatility of a 30-70 portfolio. I mean, it's like significantly higher in the variability of that volatility, meaning that if you were to look at it in 10 year period of time, uh, the volatility is twice as much in a 60-40 as it is in a 70-30, but the predictability of that volatility is like twice as much as well. So it's really a swing there versus uh, lower equity. And so, um, you know, if we, if we talk about well, you want to have a set asset allocation of 60-40 so that you can, you know, really hone in your risk on your portfolio. I mean, I think you're, you know, you're kidding yourself. I mean, you're not going to hone in the risk of the portfolio if you have a lot of equity. You're just simply going to have a lot of risk. So, in my opinion, there needs to be a lot more work done and maybe some better language out there about uh, the benefit of rebalancing and uh, anybody else? Yeah. The, the data actually shows that most financial advisors do the opposite of rebalancing. Um, there was a lot of data that, that showed um, at the height of the market in 2007, very heavy into stocks at the bottom of the market, March 9th of 2009, had turned to cash. So, I mean, rebalancing is good. I agree that it can be done overkill. I don't think there's a penalty to rebalancing too much other than the, the transaction costs and the, uh, you know, the taxes, but that rebalancing is primarily managing risk, but it also is a market timing strategy that, that actually works. It's everyone, we love to call ourselves contrarians, but it's really hard to buy stocks after they've fallen 50%. I love your point, Alan. And and the other thing is when we have when we look at our investor return data, and we've talked about this before in this forum, that sort of dollar weighted return data that captures investors' flows. We're looking at all investors, so it's not just the dumb individual investor you often hear about makes these poor timing decisions. Advisors do it, institutions do it. When we look at target date funds repositioning in the wake of the bear market, what were they doing? Well, they were adding to bonds, of course. And what have they been doing in the past couple of years? Well, many of them have been, have been adding to equities again, like Fidelity's. So there's plenty of blame to go around in terms of these timing errors, and I agree that as sort of an enforced discipline, rebalancing helps get you headed in the right direction. Just one topic that has been touched on, but we haven't actually stated it. Uh, people talk about the tax cost of rebalancing. If you have taxable accounts and tax sheltered accounts, such as IRAs or 401ks, to the extent possible, you want to do your rebalancing in those tax sheltered accounts so that there are no tax costs. And that's a problem if you're doing tax location where you have most of your bonds in your IRA. Because right? usually it's stocks that go up, and if the stocks are all in your personal account and you need to do a rebalance, you're actually going to incur higher taxes. Um, and so it runs counter to you know asset location. Did we solve any problems? Today? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, you know, I think that Alan did it. Whatever works for you, just be disciplined about it. That's the right thing to do. I used to say if you can't be right, at least be consistent. And I've changed that view. The consistency is more important than being right. <laughs> okay, the next question for the panel. Uh, can you provide some simple, high-level guidelines for tax-efficient withdrawals in retirement? Sure. Um, generally speaking, uh, the first thing you need to figure out is whether you anticipate spending down your entire portfolio during your lifetime or leaving a large part of it to your heirs. If you expect to leave a large part of it to your heirs, Leaving behind a large taxable account is often very efficient because they'll get a step up in cost basis, which is to say that their cost basis when they inherit it will be equal to the market value when you die. <clears throat> Conversely, if you expect to spend it down during your lifetime, then the taxable account is now the least efficient one, so it's usually the one that you want to spend from first. And then as far as spending between Roth accounts and tax deferred accounts, the question it's just the same one that you've been looking at forever in terms of which one to contribute to. It's just flipped on its head. It's, is my tax rate, my marginal tax rate, higher now than I expect it to be in the future? 
or is it lower now than I expect it to be in the future? And if your tax rate right now when you're starting to take money out is lower than you expect it to be in the future, perhaps because you haven't started taking Social Security yet, that's when you want to spend from tax deferred accounts. If your marginal tax rate is higher now than you expect it to be in the future, then that's when you would want to prioritize spending from Roth accounts. There's nothing, investing is simple, taxes aren't. Uh, you know, there are rules of thumb that work sometimes, but probably more often than not don't work. Uh, sometimes it's better to pay taxes at a lower rate sooner than at a higher rate later when Social Security uh, kicks in. So uh, a bunch of different rules, and I use a strategy of multiple Roth conversions with being able to recharacterize or hit that undo button the next year to kind of manage the marginal tax bracket and, and then to uh, uh, essentially sell it back to the government if the asset class you uh, do the conversion to goes down. I think another thing that um, these guys have alluded to that is really important is the benefit of tax diversification, which is something that this audience knows well, that the more different pools with different tax treatments that you can pull from, the more you can sort of manage those tax brackets on a year-to-year -year basis. I think sometimes people want that rule that they're just going to be dogmatic about, well, deplete this and then move on to that and move on to that. And in reality, I think if a tax advisor would look at it or Mike were to look at it, he would say, no, we're maybe going to take a little bit of this this year and a little bit of that, rather than just sort of sequentially going through each pool of assets. Sorry, one more thing to add. A lot of times people make the mistake of thinking that their marginal tax rate is the same as their tax bracket, and that's very often not the case, especially once you're retired, because there will be various tax breaks for which you qualify, for which you will not qualify if your income grows too much. So for instance, one of them is Social Security. Uh, often none of it is taxed. At the most, 85% of it can be taxed. So when you're receiving Social Security, you're in this time where Additional income not only causes the normal amount of income tax, it also causes more Social Security to become taxable. So even if you're in, let's say, the 15% tax bracket, you get a marginal tax rate of 22 or even 27%. And there's another similar sort of thing going on if you uh, retire prior to Medicare eligibility and you're buying insurance on the exchanges, where additional income can cause the size of your subsidies to go down. So effectively, your marginal tax rate is much higher than tax bracket you're in. So often, the best thing to do, rather than just looking at the tax brackets and saying, oh, I'm estimating my income will be such and such amount, is actually to plug numbers into TurboTax and then move them around a little bit. If I have an extra thousand dollars of tax deferred distributions, how do my taxes change? Because that's your actual marginal tax rate and it's not always going to be the same in your tax bracket. <coughs> Okay, the next question for the panel is, what are your thoughts on obtaining long-term care insurance versus self-insuring? Um, what asset level would you need to be at if you decide to self-insure? And then the thoughts on the viability of long-term care insurance product. Uh, there are new blended products that may include annuities and or life insurance. Ages are in the mid-60s. Anybody have any comments about that? long-term care? A lot of questions there. Um, the, I don't have a hard and fast number on when you should, and I've, I've been informed, and I think it's a, a true assertion that, that self-insuring is, is not a proper term, and that in, when you're insuring anything, you're pooling your risk with other people. Um, so it's sort of, I prefer self-fund when we think about paying for long-term care out of pocket. Um, I guess I'll share a story though from my personal life, which is that um, my mom and dad, I think, had been informed or had been um, advised to self-fund for long-term care costs. And uh, my dad had dementia, and um, uh, my mom needed care in the home because she had more health care considerations. So at some point we were in a, in a situation where my dad was, we moved my dad to a facility with his um, Alzheimer's to give him more care, and yet we still had caregivers at home for my mom. And as the person, um, not writing the checks out of my own accounts, but as the person overseeing all of this, you can imagine that certainly in a big urban area that gets very expensive very quickly. So if you're sort of thinking about self-insuring or self-funding long-term care, really run the numbers on what these costs could look like for both you and your spouse and think through kind of the worst case scenario. Um, in terms of the 
uh, viability of the long-term care insurance market. I think that um, arguably the pricing is as bad as it's going to get in terms of um, long-term care insurance if you're purchasing a new policy today, given how low interest rates are, given that insurers know what they know about how bad their claims experience has been, that they're pricing it pretty aggressively to protect themselves on the downside. So um, I know Michael Kitsis has argued that he thinks that, that perhaps the worst is over in terms of long-term care premium increases. I'm not sure whether that's true, but um, I guess I the more that I've experienced this, the more that I put myself a little more in that insurance camp as opposed to this idea of, of self-funding. It's one of a few subjects that I'm actually agnostic on. It is true insurance, and I'm a believer in buying insurance, but you can't buy it anymore because of the underpricing and, and, and trying to buy market share. You can't buy it anymore where your rate is going to be fixed. So you could end up paying for it for 10 years and then you know, many consumers now are getting a 100, 150% price increase. So uh, you know, I do believe that if you can self-fund, self-insure, uh, that's probably the way to go. I don't have it. As far, one easy answer though is the question of should you mix it with the whole life or universal life or other products to help that was, is my answer there. Okay, this is uh, for Rick Ferry. Uh, what role should a REIT fund play in a portfolio for someone who is 8 to 10 years from retirement? And where is it best placed? Uh, tax deferred question. So REITs are the only alternative asset class that I actually include in a portfolio. And normally it just goes into the uh, non-taxable account. In fact, the perfect place for REITs is a Roth IRA uh, because it has a, a both income and growth. Uh, if we can't go into a Roth, then we go into a regular IRA. But REITs are a different animal than common stock because of uh, flow through. They don't pay any taxes at the corporate level as long as they distribute 90% of the free cash flow uh, to the shareholders then uh, it's a flow through entity much like a uh, limited partnership. Um, the underlying premise of REITs is that people rent apartments, they rent office space, they rent store space now single-family homes, and uh, they pay rent. And the income from rents is fairly stable, even during economic downturns. So even though REIT prices will go up and down, the income from real estate is uh, fairly stable, even during the crash of uh, 2008, uh, 7 and 8, and early uh, 2009. So, um, it actually uh, it becomes a different animal, and there are times that real estate REITs, like the Vanguard REIT ETF, uh, which is very low cost and broadly diversified into equity REITs, there are different types of REITs, but these are just equity REITs that buy property, uh, will be negatively correlated with the rest of the stock market. So by having a, an allocation to REITs, and I, I think 10% is about right, uh, you, you can gain some diversification benefit, and also gain a little bit more income in your portfolio because of this alternative asset class. So that's where I... Rick, I have a follow-up question for you on this. Um, in terms of my personal property ownership, how does that factor into my REIT ownership? And also, um, what do you think about direct ownership of property? Because when I think about some of the most well-off seniors I know, that's in, in the mix for them. So is that a good idea, never a good idea because it's too undiversified okay. an asset? Well, I think that... It, it complements each other as opposed to one or the other. Uh, you know, owning a home, owning some rental property is very localized. And uh, of course the cash flows and the returns are better if it's well managed and it's in a good location. Uh, REITs are, you, know, you own a thousand properties, thousands and thousands of properties all over the country in a REIT index. And so you're getting the, uh, you know, the market-based return of real estate. And uh, to me, if you're able to have rental property, if you are doing it directly by buying properties or single family homes or apartments um, or maybe you're getting involved with some very 
good people who you know personally who are running uh, partnerships. Uh, that's not that, that's a diversification. I, I, I consider it a complement as opposed to one of the other. And I don't want to get involved in people who you don't know when it comes to private real estate. Okay, here's a question for the panel from uh, Samuel Muller. Can you buy an annuity in a Roth I, in a Roth uh, SBIA? Is it a good idea if you're in a high tax bracket? You can buy IRA annuities, basically, um, in terms of income annuities. I'm not aware that you can buy one within an IRA as such. Um, but you can move a portion of your Roth IRA to an IRA annuity. And it functions the same way where the payouts from it would, if it's a Roth, the payouts from it would be free from income tax. You know, in most cases, I would say the Roth money is the last money you want to use. So I would probably recommend against it. And I'm not against annuities. And the best deferred annuity out there is delaying Social Security. For the panel, what do you see as the ideal amount of inflation protected securities one should have in their account? Taking into account key variables such as age, size of nest date, so forth, and why? Um, what do you see as the best vehicle for this investment? Vanguard fund, actual bonds? I'm trying to see the range of responses from experts to help target an appropriate amount for our portfolio. Um, I will uh, just talk about what Ibbotson uh, puts out in terms of recommended allocations. For accumulators, certainly young accumulators, nothing in TIPS or I-bonds or anything like that. The basic idea is that that human capital over time should um, be somewhat inflation adjusted, that that person should qualify for cost of living increases as the years go by with their salary. Um, and then the, the TIPS allocation begins to step up for people who are in their 50s and 60s and so on. I believe at the high end, Ibbotson would recommend like a third of um, overall, maybe a fourth or a third of overall fixed income exposure going into something that's inflation protected? I believe in the asset class, but the answer is it definitely it depends. I mean, if you're a government employee and you have access to the G fund, which is like an intermediate term treasury with no interest rate risk, you know, that's, that's a much superior product. I'm also a believer in certain CDs, as, as Bill Bernstein mentioned. But I like the asset class, the single best vehicle, in my opinion, is the Vanguard inflation protected, the intermediate term, not the short term. Uh, and then if it's a ETF, probably the iShares uh, tips, even though it has a higher expense ratio. Uh, I believe it, uh, Christine, uh, on the younger people don't really need tips because in the long run, stocks are going to take care of any unanticipated inflation that we might have. Now, in the short run, stocks are not the ideal anti unanticipated inflation vehicle uh, tips are, but I'm not sure if younger people really need that protection. Uh, the bond portfolio that I run, where a retiree may have a greater position in bonds, would have 20% in tips in it, and the rest of the bond portfolio is intermediate term. And I think that may be enough. But I'm not going to uh, you know, state that if somebody wants the 30%, that's fine. It, it, whatever suits you and makes you feel comfortable, the rate of return and the risks are not that much different. I would also say that it depends from one retiree to another. Some are more exposed to inflation risk than others. If you own your home, you have much less inflation risk than somebody who's renting. If you have a pension that's inflation adjusted that satisfies most of your basic needs or all of them. You have less inflation risk than somebody who has only Social Security and it only satisfies a very small part of their needs. So it varies even among retirees. Okay, um, here's a question for the panel from Steve Hewitt. Is the three fund portfolio the best, al best asset allocation choice or is tilting small cap and value better over time? <laughs> Here we go again. Yeah, the answer is, uh, the answer is yes. 
No, um, either one. Okay, can I give my little spiel about the difference between philosophy and strategy here? Would that be okay? Oh, absolutely. Okay. As long as it's not political, because no one will shoot me. I don't think it's political. Okay, so here's, a, here's my two-minute version of what we all do as investors and how we become successful investors. Uh, investing is divided up into three parts. Uh, first, you have a philosophy. What do you believe about the markets? Now, is anybody here not a Boglehead? I'm pretty sure if you're not a Boglehead, please raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so everybody here has the same philosophy, correct? How many people in this room have exactly the same portfolio? <laughs> Nobody. Because that's strategy. So, strategy is taking the investments that are out there. By the way, I used to call them products, but now I... <laughs> So you have the philosophy of a Vogelhead low cost, poorly diversified, don't try to time the market, all the good Vogelhead beliefs. And now you look at the investments that are available, and we're going to build a strategy. Strategy is personal. Refund portfolio, that works. Heavily tilting towards small cap value, that works. It all works. If that's your strategy, as long as you do the third thing, which is have the discipline to maintain the strategy, it will work. And who's going to say whether a tilted portfolio is going to outperform a three-fund portfolio? No one in this room can say that. I don't know. But if it's your strategy to do that, as long as you're, you implement that strategy and maintain that strategy with discipline and continually remind yourself why you're doing that through education, then the whole thing works and you'll be a successful investor. If you break any link in that chain, then you're not going to be successful at it. If you lose the philosophy, if you keep shifting the strategy, if you don't maintain the discipline, it isn't going to work no matter what you do. That's my answer. Anybody else? Uh, as the author of How a Second Grader Beat Wall Street, and if you look at the eight lazy portfolios, the last I looked, the three fund second grader portfolio was in the first place. <laughs> okay, uh, here's a question from Dr. Karen Oates. Wade Fowl has done new research and continues to provide new data, which is spinning heads. How does his research impact on the scholarly research of the distinguished panel? <laughs> oh, and I, you know, of course, uh, Wade is doing great work, and uh, I read his, his, his research, and it makes a lot of sense, and it's changed my thinking, as I already have alluded to. Um, I think this is a huge issue, and it hasn't been given enough thought, and uh, so I think Wade's doing great work. Anyone else? I'll just comment. Um, my colleague at Morningstar, sort of Wade's equivalent of Morningstar, David Blanchett, who's our head of uh, retirement research, um, continues to conduct research into this area of sort of optimal retiree glide paths. His conclusions are different from Wade's. He believes in the traditional glide path where you actually get more conservative as the years go by. Um, his assertions, and he's not here to talk about it, but he and I have talked a lot about it. His assertion is that um, the differential, the Im improvement that uh, Wade and Michael Kitsis have identified are is, is minor, especially given the um, psychological impediments that might accompany a, a higher equity glide path in retirement. So um, that's kind of where he's coming down, and um, that's the direction that his research has been pointing in uh, in support of a more traditional in retirement glide path. So it's I, it's safe to say that Morningstar will sort of be in that camp for now. And David Blanchett, Michael Kitsis, and, and I were on a Morningstar panel talking about glide path. And, and I'm on David's camp, and I've had a lot of discussion with Wade on this, who I have immense respect for. Uh, the, the difference between the flat glide path and the increasing glide path is immaterial. That, that's point number one. Point number two is behaviorally, it, it's almost impossible to get people to stay the course, much less increase equities after they plunge. And then finally, I did my own Monte Carlo simulation that, that I discussed with Wade, who I believe agreed with, um, showing the impact of, of expenses and emotions. You know, take that 3.5% down to about 2.5%. 
And, and that's the key factor, not performance chasing and not paying fees. Much more important than the line path. Okay, the next question. Uh, I'm a retiree. I live partly off my portfolio and therefore sensitive to its volatility. Currently, my bond allocation is dedicated entirely to Vanguard's total bond market index fund. In light of future interest rate increases, should I change this allocation? Perhaps I should diversify into short-term bond fund, or is it some other strategy to cope with this risk, or should I just do nothing and leave it alone? Well, I'm not Bill Bernstein. But, uh, I say you do nothing and leave it alone. Uh, to try to time interest rate movements is extremely difficult. Uh, at least I can say about the stock market over time, it's going to go up and it's going to hit new highs. I guess with interest rates, the best you can say is they probably won't drop below zero. And that's all you can really say about them. After that, you really don't know. Um, so I would say that uh, your, your liabilities, if you're retired, are intermediate term, they're not short term. You should have maybe a short term bond fund to cover one or two years of living expenses as an emergency fund, but after that, I think you should have intermediate term bonds. I don't believe in short term bonds. Uh, number one, last year, 44 out of the 45 economists interviewed by the Wall Street Journal forecasted that the 10 year T bond would go up this year and up significantly. One said flat, none said down. The second piece of data is those economists have a track record of being directionally correct about a third of the time, less than a coin flip. And then the third, a strategy that I use uh, of CDs that have easy early withdrawal penalties gives you kind of an intermediate term return and you pay that easy penalty to get out if rates go up and have much less of a downside than, than what might happen if uh, to total bond if interest rates uh, did rise. You know, Goldman Sachs can't take advantage of it because $250,000 of FDIC insurance is, is rounding to them, but it is a market inefficiency created by the FDIC and the NCUA that, that really gives us uh, the ability to outperform or an above market return. I like the idea of having some sort of dedicated cash piece in addition to maybe an intermediate term bond fund, total bond market or otherwise. Um, that's kind of the strategy when I talk about this bucket system of retirement planning, the basic ideas. And there is a drag of having some cash in your portfolio, of course, um, relative to having it invested. But the idea is that your long-term portfolio, including, or your intermediate and long-term portfolio, those pieces will do what they are going to do, and they'll maybe be a little bit volatile, but you know that you have your near-term living expenses locked down in true cash instruments. That's why I'm a believer in that strategy. I think it, it, it works uh, from a psychological standpoint that it helps the retiree tolerate those fluctuations that a, a company stock certainly, but, but possibly bonds over the next decade or two. And if you are going to have cash, put it in a, like a Sally May or, or money market that's paying 0.9% because a Vanguard prime money market account paying 0.01% will double in only 6,972. <laughs> <laughs> For the panel, uh, what's the panel's view on non-cap weighted index products? Assuming implementation was relatively low cost, 30 to 40 basis points, and turnover was modest, where could they be most effectively used in a diversified equity portfolio, such as domestic large cap, small cap, small cap value? Um, so non-cap weighted just simply means you're taking a bet toward mid-cap stocks. Uh, you take the S&P 500 and you non-cap weighted, you just do an equal weighting, per se, and you're really, really close to a Morningstar <coughs> mid-cap style box. You're just sitting right on the cusp of large cap, mid-cap. I think you bring the market capitalization of the S&P from about 50 billion down to close to maybe 11 billion. So uh, you're making a bet on mid-cap. And uh, if you want to make a bet on mid-cap stocks, then I think that you could probably do it cheaper by buying a mid-cap index fund that's cap-weighted. And I think that Gus, Gus talked about this. So there's cheaper ways to get 
there was risk exposures in your portfolio if you don't want to do all cap weighting than doing uh, an alternative weighting type portfolio. Anyone else? I agree. I do too. Really? Do you agree, Mia? <laughs> I must be wrong. <laughs> Maybe I should change my mind. <laughs> this is a question that I asked the last panel. Uh, I'd like to repeat it for this panel to see if there's any difference of opinion. Um, the question was, um, be interested in hearing the panel's viewpoints on portfolio construction in retirement based on three different approaches. Uh, the aging bonds, the bucket approach, and the liability matching portfolio. I can take the, I can take, I'll take the bucket one. That was the one that I just talked about, the basic idea. And I've written a lot about this on Morningstar.com, kind of to illustrate the logistics of this and to get people off of this income-only mindset, which is something I confront a lot in my work where retirees want to just try to subsist off of whatever income the portfolio kicks off. So the basic idea is that you've got one to two years' worth in true cash, one, one to two years' worth of living expenses in true cash instruments maybe um, income for years three through eight or three through 10 of retirement in bonds and then everything else in stocks. Um, we sort of arrive at those uh, allocations by thinking about, well, 95% of the time equities are in positive territory over rolling 10 year period. So if you have at least a 10 year time horizon, it seems like you could reasonably put everything um, for those years in stocks. And so the idea is um, that you're using your income distributions from the rest of the portfolio to fill up that bucket one as you deplete it, as you spend that money in it. And if that doesn't get you there, then you turn to rebalancing proceeds to help fill up that bucket one. So I think it's a, an easy strategy to understand. It's an easy strategy to explain. Hearing from our users, I get the sense that people have um, some success in keeping this strategy going in their portfolios. I think it works from a psychological standpoint, and I would take pains to note that this is not original to me. This is really Harold Domensky's strategy, something that he's used with his clients. Um, and I have just taken the strategy and illustrated it with actual fund holdings. Um, but you can find a lot of work on that topic including some stress tests of my bucket portfolios that sort of show, well, how did this work on a year-to-year -year basis? Where did we go for cash? In some years, the income distributions were enough. In some years, we had to pull from some of the longer-term investments. So my um, idea is just to kind of illustrate the logistics of this, which I think for a lot of individual investors trying to figure this out themselves can be kind of black boxy. So I've just been trying to um, present the life of the portfolios and show how the cash flow process would work. Economic theory would say the bucket approach is bunk, but economic theory assumes we're all logical, rational beings. In reality, we're, we're feeling beings. So I, I, I come to totally agree with you that the bucket approach kind of psychologically helps one to stay the course. As far as the liability matching strategy, that's certainly the safest choice. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the term, it's basically just one method of implementing it would be a tip slider, to the extent that you can build one with bonds maturing every year to cover your living expenses. But as Jack said, that's super expensive. It takes a whole lot of money, especially with tip seals as low as they are. So one method that I think makes some sense is to use that strategy but just for basic needs, the stuff that you're absolutely unwilling to compromise on to the extent that your social security or pension or other sources of income don't satisfy those needs. A liability matching portfolio to satisfy the remainder of them can make sense. But again, it's going to be expensive. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, in the end, it's going to be whatever strategy you can maintain as what um, Alan keeps referring to. I never liked age in bonds. Uh, it just seems uh, counterintuitive uh, to me that uh, if, you're, if you're 40 years old, you should have 40% of your portfolio in bonds just because you're 40 years old. Or if you're 50, you should have 50 just because you're 50. Um, I think that if you have no other way of 
and nothing else to look at. Uh, I, I think age in bonds is maybe you know, baby step number one, but, but you can quickly go up the ladder to better, better methodologies than that. I mean, even, even if you start with, if you're going to accumulate assets, you have a 60-40 portfolio, and when you start decumulating assets, you start with a 30-70 portfolio, and you work from there. Um, but the bucket approach, it makes sense. Uh, it, it gives you a plan for getting income. And of the three choices, um, I, the bucket approach to me makes the most sense. I'm giving a talk in about a month to a group of financial planners who definitely believe in the liability approach. In fact, they take zero coupon treasury bonds and they ladder them out 15 years when somebody retires. Now, how much for the first 15 years of a person's retirement, they're going to do a structured laddered zero coupon bond portfolio. I said, wow, what a, what, a, what a tremendous amount of interest rate risk you take when you do that to, to buy one day structure a laddered portfolio of zero coupon bonds out 15 years. You better hope that interest rates don't go up during that 15 year period of time and you kind of shot yourself in the foot. So uh, I'm not all. Mike, Mike makes a good point about perhaps doing some liability matching with zero coupon bonds or treasuries, uh, treasury tips um, you know, in, in the very short run. But I think that of the three choices, the bucket approach makes the most sense to me. Next question is uh, from Ray James. Uh, given the mantra, lifestyle and spending won't increase without pay rises. Would the future education costs continue to rise as rapidly like PEs in the stock market? Does education and healthcare pricing at some point return to the mean? And any advice on the best investments to protect from these future costs that are available today? It has to return to the median at some point, otherwise it becomes the entire economy, which of course doesn't make any sense uh, as far as how to protect against it, health insurance, as far as how to protect against education costs. I'm not really sure. I think we've seen some preliminary preliminary signs that both <laughs> sets of costs are starting to modulate a little bit. Um, certainly with the healthcare numbers that we see, what the, I won't get political, but I, I think that um, there's some indication that, that perhaps the Affordable Care Act has helped drive down healthcare costs a little bit. Um, and it, we're also seeing it. I have a colleague who works on the college savings front almost full time and just talking about funding 529s and all that stuff and watches college costs very, very, very closely. And what you continue to see is that costs at the very uh, top tier of universities, they can continue to push through those increases in tuition, but kind of um, at the middle ground, and certainly the state universities continue to be very constrained as well in terms of um, being affected by state budgets. But kind of the middle ground, um, some of the, the smaller schools, um, the smaller private colleges have in fact begin, begun to um, modulate the tuition increases a little bit. We've even seen some declines. So I hope that trend will persist. In my past life, a long, long time ago, I was director of financial planning at the corporate office of Kaiser Permanente, and you could have won a lot of money betting that that price increases would have had to have collapsed you know, a long time before you know, where we are now. Um, so it is a big threat, healthcare, in my opinion. I know we're not supposed to be political, but I'm not. Um, optimistic that our politicians are going to work together to solve what I think is a huge problem. Um, but sooner or later, it, it has to collapse. Education, you know, sooner or later, you know, it has to slow down. It can't, you know, neither can be 110% of our GDP. This uh, relates to our cognitive facilities decline as we age. And the question is, please provide suggestions on how to simplify our lives in retirement. For example, is putting investments into a single target retirement fund and getting automatic monthly withdrawals a good idea, like live on autopilot? Auto 
I'll take that um, because it's, it's interesting as I've worked more in this retirement planning space and worked on the logistics of these bucket strategies, the more I've realized, you know, this is even a simplified version of a retirement portfolio is pretty darn complicated. Um, so I think if you're the person who's the main person in charge of your family's household finances, I think it's really important to start thinking about how do I simplify this portfolio? How do I kind of create a succession plan for this portfolio, especially if I have a spouse or um, maybe I don't have a spouse, how do I simplify this whole thing for myself? And so um, I often hear that, you know, maybe a one fund solution is a good idea. My um, big issue with that approach, uh, whether it's a target date fund or some sort of a good quality balanced fund or Vanguard Wellington or something like that is that when you take those distributions out, you're getting a portion of your stock holdings and you're getting a portion of your bond holdings back to you at the same time. In 2008, you did not want a portion of your stock holdings sent back to you. You wanted to be able to pick and choose. You probably wanted to draw from your safe stuff and leave your stocks there to rebound. So I like the idea of, um, I think a better alternative would be perhaps to have just a couple fund portfolio, maybe the three fund portfolio or whatever it might be. Or I think that Vanguard's managed payout fund, um, and I know there was some talk about it on the previous panel, I think that's actually the right mousetrap in terms of a more intelligent distribution setup, and I expect to see more funds in that vein. Uh, when I think about sort of the suite of retirement income funds that are out there, in my view, most of them are not really ready for prime time. But I do think that that managed payout fund in that the distributions um, can come from a variety of sources, income sources, return of your own capital, which a lot of retirees have a big psychological impediment with, but sometimes that's the right answer. I think that that's the right direction, and I would expect to see more growth in that area. Frankly, I'm surprised that the managed payout fund has kind of struggled along because I think it's a very, very good product. I researched this extensively for a piece that I wrote for AARP magazine. And uh, what I came down to is the best protection is simplification. Having a family member that you know and trust and you know, always know what their key incentives are. Um, SPIA, single premium immediate annuities, you know, they, they do protect you from mistakes later in life, but I think that they are still uh, oversold. <laughs> You know, we're, we're all concerned about do we want to go intermediate term bonds or stay short term, but when you think of what a SPIA is, it, it, it's a bond fund, it's a bond with the duration for the rest of your life. I think aside from your portfolio, there's other things you can do to simplify. Uh, just minimize the number of bank accounts you have, buying IRAs, all over 401ks into IRAs, now there's some tax considerations where you might not necessarily want to do that. Pay off your mortgage, delay Social Security, so that you know, that's a, there's no decisions to make once you start taking Social Security. You don't have to manage it the way you manage your portfolio. So there's a lot of things you can do to simplify things aside from cutting down the number of funds if that doesn't really appeal to you. Uh, just going to change the subject a little bit. Uh, I've been approached uh, at least three times at this conference with the same question or the same comment. So I'm going to address it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm one of you. I have a real concern about my spouse. She doesn't really like this stuff. You know, I come here, I love this stuff. So I told her about you. And, and when I die, she's supposed to call me. <laughs> How many phone calls have I gotten in the last 11 years of coming to these conferences? where the spouse has called me. And this is good news for you, because it means none of you will ever die. The <laughs> <laughs> answer is zero. <laughs> so if you out here who are well-educated and you're sort of taking the, the lead and figuring out uh, what, you're, what you're currently doing with your own investments, and if you want your spouse to work with an advisor in my Allen or anybody out there, just telling them to pick up the phone and call that advisor or email that advisor when you're dead doesn't work. Okay? There needs to be something else. So some sort of a relationship needs to be established with you, your children, the advisors, so that they have a warm and comfy and understand the philosophy and perhaps understand the strategy as well and the discipline. Um, 
in order to make the transition of wealth. Because I can tell you, just by telling your spouse, Paul Allen or Paul Rick or Paul someone else in the audience or whomever, it doesn't work. Uh, that that, that long-lost cousin from Merrill Lynch always seems to show up in the way. And the variable annuity sales pitch begins. <laughs> Question for the panel from uh, Samuel Mahler. Evaluate the risk of waiting until later in retirement to buy an annuity, assuming a pension and Social Security doesn't cover your expected spending. You know, the older you are, the more life credits you get on buying an annuity. And again, the single best annuity, and the way I framed it for a client who wanted to buy a SPIA and take Social Security early was deferring it from four years, from 66 to age um, 70, was like buying that deferred annuity at a 45% discount. Um, so again, the longer you wait in buying a SPIA, uh, the, the more life credit you're getting, and then less that goes to um, intermediaries that profit the agent that sells it to you and, and the insurance company needs to make a profit and essentially they're taking your money and they're putting in roughly 85% in bonds and 15% in stocks and alternatives. So it's an indirect, more expensive uh, thing to get, but it does provide those life credits and gives some insurance against you know, longevity. Uh, this is for uh, Christine. Uh, we are to retire in two years. We will roll over our IR 401k in the Vanguard. What is the easiest place to put our middle bucket? Um, so, I guess the question is, um, well, the, the way I think about segmenting the portfolio in terms of the bucket strategy, I kind of said it, that we've got cash for very near-term living expenses, then um, generally fixed income and instruments for bucket two, which is roughly three to eight years worth of three to ten for years three through 10 of retirement and then um, stocks beyond that. So when I think about that bucket too, I think about mainly core fixed income instruments, maybe total bond market, maybe some little tweak to give it an extra emphasis on corporates. I also typically put in, um, and I know Rick doesn't like short-term bond funds, but I typically would put in a short-term bond fund sort of at the front end of that bucket too. The idea is in some sort of catastrophic scenario where the retiree has gone through bucket one and there's nothing, can't shake out any living expenses or enough living expenses from the portfolio to refill it, that you would turn to that uh, short-term bond fund as your next line reserves. So that's kind of how I think about structuring it um, at the tail end of Bucket two, you might also think about having some sort of a balanced fund, whether it's you know something like Wellesley Income or uh, uh, Wellington even, to um, give that portion of the portfolio just a little bit of a, a growth boost. Uh, this one for Rick. Uh, I'm age 63 and will probably work for three more years. Thinking of converting all or most of a small traditional IRA to a Roth IRA before 70 and a half. What is the best time to do the conversion, and what should be some consideration in the follow-up as well? I'm actually going to pass on that. Um, that that's a tax question, and, uh, and I'm not a tax expert, so I'm, not, I'm actually going to pass on it. Pass it to Mike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are talking about it earlier. It's just how your current marginal tax rate compares to the tax rate you expect to have in the future. Um, if your current marginal tax rate is higher than the tax rate you expect to have down the road, Roth conversion do not make sense if there's a possible exceptions if you think you're leaving the money to your heirs, then you're comparing it to their tax rate actually. But for the most part, unless your tax rate now is lower than the tax rate you expect to have in the future, and again this is a marginal tax rate, then Roth conversions would not make sense. Although Roth conversion Rock conversions do give you some, you know, tax diversification, and I think the question was on timing. The best time to do the conversion is January second, the first day the market is open, and you have until October fifteenth of the following year to hit that undo button to do that, um, 
you know, recharacterization to undo it. And um, tax planning, that recharacterization helps a whole lot, as well as if the asset goes down, uh, you hit that undo button and make the government buy it back at, at the original price. So I do multiple Roth conversions on my own account every year. Sorry, just adding one more thing. Uh, in terms of the timing from not within the year, but one year as opposed to the other. Uh, a lot of it depends on whether in your early years of retirement you will be buying insurance on the new exchanges. Um, if you're not retiring until 65, that's not a concern. So Medicare, if you have insurance through a former employer, not a concern. But if you will be buying insurance on those exchanges, you can often qualify for significant subsidies if you make a point to keep your income low. And all conversions would really kind of ruin that. So, in that case, then you've got this, let's say you retire at 60, so you're buying insurance on the exchanges for five years, and then you're starting Social Security at 70. It's those years after you're finished buying the insurance on the exchange, so starting at 65, and before Social Security kicks in at 70. That would be the range when you're most likely to want to be doing the conversions. The follow-on question, uh, are international bond funds really necessary is there a currency risk associated with them, and can't one get the benefit of an allocation to bonds with total bond market index? Okay, I can't answer that one. <laughs> um, the international bond fund question. I'm agnostic. Uh, you know, these are interest rate bearing bonds, and you know whether they're from Europe or. And, and then you hedge out the currencies, and that's a little more costly. The cost of the bond fund is a little higher. Hedging out the currency is a little higher. And you're sort of eating away at the income from the bond fund. I think that uh, you can do all the analysis you want about the diversification benefit of it and how having foreign bonds might give you incrementally a little bit better rate of return on a risk-adjusted basis. But after uh, the cost of uh, hedging, after the extra fee, I've never really been sold on, on the idea of adding uh, an international bond fund, even the Vanguard bond fund. And uh, interesting that Gus was uh, talking about that dinner that we had 10 years ago. But well, one of the other things that Gus and I discussed at that dinner was, why doesn't Vanguard have an international bond fund? And if Gus is still in the room, is he? I don't think so. But his answer was, I don't see any point to it. And I said, I agree but people want it. So I think that Vanguard sometimes creates products because people want them, and then they create the theory after that. And uh, it's exactly uh, you know, the criticism that uh, Gus had for Smart Beta. Uh, I think that uh, you could say that Vanguard is guilty of the same thing. Now, they do create products because people want them, not necessarily because the people at Vanguard actually believe in them. And if you ask me, or if you have asked Gus 10 years ago, he would say, I don't see the need for it. So that's right. That's what I believe. Vanguard has been talking to me about international bonds for, for many, many years. And I really do believe it was a 20-year product launch. Uh, and, and their argument is really good. You know, since I believe in international stocks, why wouldn't I believe in international bonds for diversification? And I researched this and researched this and eventually came out kind of lukewarm. I bought a little bit myself, put my toe in the water. It was what, what Vanguard was hoping for. And the two reasons, yes, it's hedged to the US dollar, which, which I happen to agree with. But with 20 bips plus another 5 bips or 0.25% in total, uh, the other 5 bips comes from the hedging costs. Uh, it's three times more expensive than total bond. And let's face it. Um, if the Vanguard total bond market goes to zero, that means the Treasury has gone to zero, and you know, that diversification is not going to help. I, um, I, I, I kind of agree with what the panelists have said. I think, though, Vanguard's product is a good product, certainly relative to other international bond products on the market. What I would say is when I look at this category, it's one of the most diverse of any that we track. So there are all sorts of different strategies going on. And really the, the key differentiator, one of the keys is this currency hedging thing. So um, we would at Morningstar strongly favor the hedged 
type product because the unhedged product like act very bond, unbond like, so you have a lot of currency related volatility. So while we favor the hedged products, I, I think I generally agree with what the other panelists have said. Uh, this is a question for Rick. Um, reading much about the world economy slowing and the potential for stagflation, deflation, uh, any strategies you recommend in this uh, stagflation, deflation environment? Well, if I knew for a fact that we were actually going to go into a stagflation, deflation environment, then maybe I could create a strategy that would take advantage of that and I could get two and 20 on my hedge fund. Uh, <laughs> stay the course. I mean, you've got a strategy, stick, stick to it. Um, if there's a little stagflation or deflation, it'll reverse eventually. Um, you're better off just staying the course. Bonds. In fact, Vanguard's economic model that I looked at showed a 15% probability of deflation over the next uh, 10 years. I spoke to Roger a couple of days ago, um, and he said they decreased uh, that probability now. But again, what will work? Treasury bonds in a deflationary environment. And, and oh, that's, wow. yeah, go long. But again, since we don't know what's going to happen, and because the yield curve is still relatively steep, I believe in the you know the intermediate term part of the yield curve plus CDs. Have I mentioned CDs? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple of questions left. Uh, this is for the panel. Uh, since interest rates are so low, are stock funds better held in a Roth than bond funds? <laughs> Well, if I could get all of my money into a Roth, that's where I hold it. But uh, a stock fund's better in a Roth than a bond fund. But that's a, again, that, that, that gets to be a tax question. Uh, if the market goes up a lot, then yeah, I think so. Uh, if the market doesn't go up, you probably want the bonds in your Roth. But uh, again, that, we're getting into asset location strategies and where should you put your assets based on where taxes are today, what your income is today, trying to anticipate later on down the road what taxes are going to be later on down the road and what, uh, uh, you know, what the growth of these assets are going to be. It's very, very difficult to do. As, as Alan pointed out, taxes are much more difficult to try to figure out. So. Um, the question again was getting back. Getting question was, would it be better to put bonds or stocks in a Roth? I think it was the bottom line of the question. I'm going to say I would choose one or the other. I'd say stocks. But, uh, I think it's a time horizon question, really. I mean, that, that, that you should let that dictate what you hold in that account based on when you whether and when you expect to tap it. Certainly, if it's something that you're leaving to kids and grandkids, I would put long-term high growth stuff in it. If it's something that I expected to need uh, for my living expenses, I'd have it shortened up accordingly. I, I think that you want to locate stocks first in your taxable account, then your Roth, and then the least efficient places in your IRA. Mike, you, I think you may disagree, and we're going to have a talk, and I, this guy is really, really smart, and I may be wrong. <laughs> I generally wouldn't put anything in taxable unless you have to. That's where we, where we disagree. Um, but I still agree with the typical asset location advice that you'll find on Bogle Heads, which is to tax shelter your bonds, which is to say put them in a retirement account prior to tax sheltering your stocks, even though interest rates are low right now. Um, now, that said, the advantageousness of doing that is certainly less than it is when interest rates are quite high. But we don't know how long interest rates will stay that way, because in addition to what Rick was saying about how tax laws change, obviously market conditions change too. So basing an asset location decision on exactly where interest rates are today isn't necessarily a great idea. It's not bulletproof anyway. You know, we get into this tax location discussion, and you know, you can either try to uh, locate all the tax inefficient stuff in your retirement accounts and your uh, more tax efficient stuff like uh, you know, stocks or especially stock ETFs, not Vanguard per se, but other stock ETF, ETFs. Uh, there, there's a real tax benefit if you're going to do anything other than a Vanguard fund. If you find an ETF uh, that, that does it and 
Defense Equity, you probably use the ETF because of the, uh, the, the, the tax efficiency of the way ETFs are. Now, Vanguard's a little, little bit different, but um, uh, and, uh, this debate between should you do the same asset allocation in all your accounts or pretty close to it, or should you do tax location? I mean, it just keeps going back and forth and back and forth. And there's, there's benefits to doing one where it's simple and, and you don't get fixated on one account and what's going on in that one account. Uh, and there's benefits to doing it the other way. So I don't know. This is one of those questions that is probably never going to be resolved because we don't know what the future of taxes are. Uh, you know, they changed. I mean, in the last few years, uh, this whole equation has changed because now dividends are being taxed at a higher rate. Capital gains are being taxed at a higher rate, plus we have the, uh, the uh, meta, uh, medical tax on top of that. I mean, the whole equation changed as taxes changed. So it's difficult. But, you know, if you're talking with somebody who wants, who's not that sophisticated, you know, who, who doesn't get into all this stuff too much, I, I'm in the camp of doing the same allocation in both accounts, taxable versus non-taxable, because it's simple for them and they won't fixate on the performance of one account. So you do a, a balanced fund, for example, in both accounts as opposed to trying to do stocks in a taxable account and bonds in a retirement account because they'll just fixate on that one account and they'll probably do the wrong thing at the wrong time. So it's a sophistication level also of the, of the individual that, that matters here. Uh, the final question is for Rick and Alan. Uh, has there been any progress on nominating Jack Bogle for the presidential number three? <laughs> and I assume Jack's not here, but the answer is, uh, from what I know, is that the, the process is, has been as far as it can go. Uh, so all the paperwork is done, if I'm not mistaken, Mel, I don't know if you're involved in this or not. Um, but now we have to uh, wait through the political process of it, and this is an election year, and things take time. Well, thank you, panel, for participating.